Welcome back to Moscone West, I'm Dave Vellante, and you're watching theCUBE's continuous coverage of RSA 2024. We're here at Broadcast Alley. We're excited to have Peter McKay back in theCUBE, CEO of Sneak, and Danny Allen, newly minted CTO. Wow, it's not like we haven't seen you in theCUBE before, but welcome <laughs> back in this new role. Congratulations on a great hire, and good to see you guys. No, it's good to be here, Dave, and it's always good to be partnering with Danny again. It just took me a little while to get him, but it's good to have him. So it's good to be in this space. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. Um, no matter, seems like no matter how much we spend on cyber, the bad guys just get better and better and better. But RSA is the place to be, isn't it? I it mean, is. Wow. What a, what it always event. keeps, every year, it levels up. Again, now it's all about AI, generative AI, and so it's, uh, you know, it's never, never dull around RSA. I think we're, and we're probably back to where we were pre-COVID levels, maybe even above that. Of course, yeah. You know a little bit about security because you know data protection used to be this adjacency, and that had become a fundamental part of it. So you yeah. you learned a, what informed you to make you decide, to, other than the fact that this guy was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> one of you calling bugs, him every week. You know, right? <laughs> but what was it about Sneak and the opportunity that lured you back to well, this world? Two things. I, I actually started in application security. I don't right. know if you knew that. I spent I a decade that. doing application security, and it was super interesting. But what has lured me back is beyond the leadership team, which is absolutely fantastic, is artificial intelligence. We're actually at a place now where we can use AI and ML techniques to address security in ways that it's never been addressed before in the past. So you've been using AI before ChatGPT, so what's, what's changed since the, the AI heard around the world? Well, I think a lot of companies have been leveraging. I mean, it, it, there's like 95% of developers are using Gen AI, whether it's Copilot or, or uh, Gemini or whatever uh, generative AI solution is out there. So I think developers are using it more than ever. And there's a, you know, when you think about how our business evolved over the years, it was this incredible productivity by developers, and now they're even more productive with using gener generative AI tools, and we're just making sure that the security teams can keep up, and so I think that's what's happening. It's a huge uh, development, uh, a boost to developers and developer productivity. You just need to make sure it's secure. Well, the, the thing is, the cloud kind of became the first line of defense. Okay, now you got infrastructure as code. Now you say, okay, developer, we want you to deploy the infrastructure, great, it's nice and easy, but we also want you to secure it. Yes. Right, and now we throw AI into the mix, or you know, new AI into the mix. Now you got to worry about that. And that's not really, that's not really what they want to do. Mm. You know, they want to write code and you know, deliver business value. Now all of a sudden they're being asked to do all this other stuff, which is not really necessarily in their wheelhouse. So, was that the founding premise of, of Sneak? Actually, it probably wasn't the founding premise, but the market just sort of came to you. Well, it was, I mean, we started with, I mean, as Danny said, a lot of us came from application security where it was security tools for security people. And I think the reality is that the only way to truly solve application security is by shifting it left or moving it earlier in that software development life cycle. And so you don't want developers to slow down and you don't expect developers to be security experts. So you need to embed security in behind the scenes, allowing developers to continue to develop fast uh, don't slow them down, but build security in or decentralize it into the workflows from the IDE all the way through to make sure that developers can continue to develop code as quickly as they can, but they got to do it in a secure way. And, and the, the risks have never been greater to do that. So you know a little bit about M&A. Um, a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, rate, so you guys, let's talk about what Sneak has done in, in, in M&A. You guys have made a number of, of moves there. As an outsider, how did you sort of evaluate that? And then now let's talk about you know, where you guys going from here. Well, they've made incredible acquisitions over, since 2019, I believe, nine, nine different acquisitions yep. that have occurred. And some that stood out, Helios, uh, Enzo, uh, uh, Enzo, Enzo Deep, Deep Code, Code is Deep probably Code, one of the right, most significant yeah, ones. Right, yeah. Deep Code was interesting because it brought them into the SaaS data application security testing in a very meaningful way. We're talking about AI at this conference. They were actually doing AI before AI was a thing. Like, if you look at the way they do static application mm. security testing, they're using symbolic regression testing to find the vulnerability vulnerabilities within the code and we continue to iterate on that. But if you look at some of those other acquisitions that we've made, it's all about acquiring talent to help us build in very specific areas. Like Helios was all about understanding the runtime. Enso was all about understanding prioritization and so it's really helped us to accelerate the development at Sneak. 
What is symbolic regression testing? How is it different than regression testing? It's essentially looking at the signals, many, many different data uh, sets on top of one another to find out what are the symbols that represent a change in the code. And you can actually tell just simply by looking at that whether there's a vulnerability in the code itself. Mm. Well, a human could do that, but now you're doing it at scale. Yes, yeah. yes. So yeah. what about, um, you guys got news, App Risk Pro? App Risk Pro. What yeah. is that all about? That's the newest product. It was uh, a combination of, as Danny said, Helios acquisition, Enzo pieces, so it's a build and integrating into some of these acquisitions that allow us to take a, it's kind of been the holy grail of application security, is a holistic view of all the data that goes into an application, so you can take a 360 degree view of the application, all the, all the feeds from all the things that we do, open source code, um, runtime information, observability information, and get a complete view of that application, all the way down to what developers built what, what did they do, how it all came together, prioritize those issues, and then auto-remediate those issues. So it's, it's really the culmination of all the things that we've been doing for nine years, but bringing it all together in a, in a more of a developer first application security posture management, which is what the market has been asking for for a long time. So help me understand this, because you guys have been at this a while. Posture management's been around, but it was really the customer's responsibility to do posture management. It really wasn't like the industry had a lot of solutions, and all of a sudden yeah. posture management has become this category that's exploded, not just because yeah. Gartner you know, kind of No, not just because it. of Gartner. It created an acronym, <laughs> right? It's, yeah. it's, what has transpired to enable that? Is it that to solutionize, you know, softwareize yeah. that business? Yeah. Well, there's lots of different types of posture management, whether it be data or SaaS or, you know, cloud. network. Yeah. Data, you know, all of cloud security mm -hmm. posture management. But I actually think it perpetuates a problem, which is now you know about the issue, you've identified the issue and you know about the issue, but what do you actually do about it? So our focus at Sneak is actually great, we understand the application, we know where all the issues are, but we want to take you back to actually addressing the issue. So it's not enough to know about the configuration and that you have vulnerabilities, it's how do I actually solve that particular issue because Knowledge is great, but even better than that is solving the problem. And that's been the bane of application security. I have thousands of issues, how can I fix all these? And so the prioritization in the auto remediation is a critical part. How do you, do, how do you allow developers to continue to develop fast, but build into the security automation to the actual fixing of the issues, and that's what we focus on. What are you seeing, not to bring up super cloud, but I'll bring up super cloud, multi-cloud. It's clearly in our surveys that we do, it's showing that that's a big area of you know, contention, concern, focus for, for organizations. What's your play there? What are you seeing in terms of, of folks adopting cloud, multi-cloud? Uh, 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 how is AI, gen AI changing that? And what role do you guys play? Well, we're agnostic, right? So yeah, whether sure. you have some things in one cloud, some in another cloud, some on premises, every organization has dozens of languages. They have multiple repositories for their code. They have many, many different practices. And what Sneak brings, of course, is the ability to bring that all together so that you can prioritize across the full solution set. Mm. Yeah, and you got rela uh, expanded relationship with Google that our data, really interesting, shows, you know, Google's distant third yeah. in, in adoption in cloud but it's closing the gap with AWS in terms of AI yes. percentage of customers. Yes. Very yeah. rapidly, actually. Yeah. You saw Google Cloud Next. It was pretty impressive, you know, yeah. what, what they're doing. AWS is very impressive AI as well. They're a machine. Of course, we know the story with yeah. Microsoft. It's like an amazing judo move on the industry. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> so, to, but talk about the Google relationship. Yeah. You, you announced it. Well, yeah. yeah, so there's a couple different things, right? So we're embedded within the IDE, so if a developer wants to know about, hey, what's secrets, configuration, and management? Well, actually, there's a chatbot built into the IDE so that they can learn about it. One step further, though, we can actually analyze the code in real time. As they're writing code, we can say, here's an issue, and here's a suggested fix for that. And so we're both educating, we're fixing, we're remediating directly within the Code Assist product from Gemini. It's sick what's happening with LLMs, isn't it? I mean, the you pace saw, is unbelievable. If you play around with Llama 3, you actually, when you start editing, like for instance, the images, it generates an image, you say, you start to edit, tell you what you want, and as you're typing, it's yes, like yeah. looking ahead and changing the image in real time, and you're yes. like, how, how does it do that? Um, so, yeah. how does it do that? So, what, I guess my question for you uh, as a technologist is, 
way in in the whole LLM, leapfrogging, ping-ponging, every day we turn around, there's new LLMs, you got the issue of, of proprietary LLMs versus open LLMs, of course we all love open source, but when you read the fine print on open source, some of the terms are a little bit restrictive. As a technologist, how do you think about all this? Well, we have deep experience with LLMs and machine learning, and we have for a very long time. In fact, people don't realize this, but the Deep Code product was based on an LLM. Like, we created the rules within that product using uh, machine learning techniques. And when we started doing fixes, for example, we started with a T5 model, we switched to a Starcoder model, and actually when we tested our fixes now on GPT-4, which has almost 1.4, uh, sorry, 1.8 trillion parameters, we're 20% more accurate than GPT-4. Mm -hmm. Now why is that? Because Sneak's been deep into mm -hmm. machine learning and AI since well before it became an industry buzzword. How do you feel about the open source versus proprietary people saying, well, ultimately open source is going to swamp them. I don't know, we, sometimes those things take time. We've certainly seen the innovation on open source. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it, uh, you know, I think we, we're going to, we've always been agnostic on clouds, infrastructure, software, Whoever languages. Wins, yeah. <laughs> we're like, we're just going to watch it and we're going to secure it, right? Because every company's going to have a mixed bag. And there's, there needs to be an agnostic security solution for the, all those tools that are out there, all those Gen AI solutions, and that's what we're focused on, is just making sure we work with all of them, because the biggest companies in the world, all the way to the smallest companies, will have a mixed bag. They've always done that. And so for us, it's how do we, how do we secure all those, I mean, the more Gen AI they use, the more code you produce, the more risk you're going to have, and we just need to make sure we're securing that. So, LLM diversity is probably a good thing. It is. For it us. is unique. Yeah. Where, where do you? What do you guys? If you had a bet, we're all betting people. If you had a bet on the big debate is commoditization or you know differentiation over time. I'll tell you. I'll let you guys answer. I'll tell you where I weigh in afterwards. What do you? What do you think? Commercialization Com of commod the LLMs. Commoditization of the LLMs. Oh, these things will just be a commodity. Not that there'll be one to rule them all. Versus. Um, the innovation engine's going to keep going. The innovation engine is definitely yeah. going to keep going. It's not going to slow down at all. I think you're going to see edge niche cases where you need to use a specific type of LLM for a specific type of issue. That's not going away. Yeah. I, I personally, I, I will weigh in, I think it's going to be a game of mass customization um, at scale, and that is where the differentiation is going to live. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, yeah. across, maybe it's a long tail, uh, but I think there's plenty of room for innovation in this. There seems to be no shortage of CapEx going no. into this thing. No, no, and valuations are crazy. Very you, think so? you think so? You oh think yeah. they're crazy? Oh you, yeah. think sneaks, you think Sneak's overvalued? No, I think the AI <laughs> companies, I think we're properly valued. Uh, but the, a lot of the AI companies are, I mean, it's what you would expect in the industry. I mean, it's a, it's a very hot topic. You can hear, I mean, every company here is talking about some, some way, shape, or form, they're leveraging AI. Um, you know, it's the, it's the right time in the market for this to, to be a compelling, just because of the gains you could internally or within your products, you know, there's I mean, a lot you can benefit from. Yeah, past is not prologue, but we've seen these waves before, and there's, there's certainly many patterns in this yeah. wave that are similar to dot com, and many that are different. Um, one of the things we put out on, on Twitter the other day, we did a Twitter poll, it was actually, I don't know if you know Dave Itachiria, CEO of yes. Mongo, he yeah. and I were riffing last week, <laughs> and so he gave me the idea. So you remember Cisco was the most valuable company in the world in like 1999, yeah. 2000. So now NVIDIA, not the most valuable company in the world, but yeah. you know, they're the poster child for yes. high value companies. Is NVIDIA Cisco or is NVIDIA Google? Right, that was the question we put out there. What was, the, what was the result? Well, it, the, the poll is sort of leaning toward Google, but mixed, but I think the general consensus is somewhere in between. Yeah. Crawford yeah. Del Pret weighed in, you know Crawford from yeah. CEO of IDC, president, should, have, should be called CEO, just give the guy the promotion, <laughs> crying out loud. He weighed in saying, I think it's the combination, <laughs> NVIDIA is the equivalent of the Wintel duopoly. Ah. As it was, yeah, and actually, Furry yeah. and I were riffing on the podcast the other day. Yeah. I said, what about Apple? Because, you know, hardware and software together. Yeah. That's another analogy. I don't know, we don't know the answers to these things. I, I personally think NVIDIA's got quite a moat. I don't I think know if it's they, overvalued or undervalued, but I, I think I agree with a, you. a long runway. But to me, where the real value, and this sort of came up at Mongo last week and talking to developers, it's really the applications that are ultimately where yeah. the value yes. gets hit. Yeah. And it's the end customer. 
that creates probably more value collectively than any one you know, yeah. IT company or technology company. I think you're right. Right? And so you're yep. supporting those developers. Yep. You're, you're supporting that sort of And whatever they choose, whatever tools they use, and just make sure you don't slow them down, but be secure at the same time. Yeah, yeah we think about AI actually in two different ways. One is supporting those companies. So we, have, we actually have security tests for 30 different LLMs right now. So our customers are building LLM augmented or LLM native applications, but we also AI generated code. So we think about that new modern application and we can secure them. But then of course we use AI within our product to help them secure mm -hmm. their AI applications. IPO in the future? What are you guys saying? What can you tell us? Who knows? Who knows? I mean, we've already always viewed ourselves as becoming a public company at some point in right. time. Um, you know, you know, we raised some money over the past year. We still hasn't haven't spent the last two rounds that we raised, so we're pretty close to break even. You know, we'll pick the time. You know, it's it's good to see Rubrik and a couple others kind of coming out. Looks like there's a nice backlog of uh, building for IPOs, and I think we'll pick it when it's uh, right for us. There's a lot of discussion about. Um, you know, staying maybe private, private for, longer. for longer versus the benefits of being a public company. I, I, you know, you see both sides. You saw Cloudera almost waited too long, or they didn't have the great business model. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel like if you've got the right business model, Rubik was interesting, you know, good for them getting out, but they got, they got some work to do in terms yep. of the numbers. Yep. Um, but if you got the right business model and you can, you can pretty much predict to the best of your ability that you're going to, you know, at least hit, beat, maybe beat and raise. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like there are real advantages to being a public company or do you feel like it's too much of a hassle these days? You know, I, I think it's an advantage um, yeah. at the right time for the right company. Uh, you know, growing company, prof break even, profitability, I think is important in the mix today. Um, you know, you look at our customers. Our customers, 60 plus percent of our customers are enterprise customers who want to know that you're a public viable company that has, the, in, in the whole IPO, the branding associated with being a public company, I think is something that's important for our, for our customers and prospects in the market around the globe. And so, we do see that being uh, an inevitability at the right time. Is there a new benchmark on you got to be a billion dollar company or is it more situational? If you're a half a billion dollar you know, revenue company, you can actually go public if you've got the right metrics. I think, think if you that? have a differentiated story, I mean, the metrics got to be solid, right? Yeah. You've got to have the growth, you've got to have the path to profitability or profitable. Um, you've got to have a good customer base and you know, with uh, differentiated, defensible IP. Uh, and those are all the things that we've been kind of operating that way for the past couple of years. We feel as though from the pr predictability of our business, um, we've been there, we've been operating as if we were a public company. So we're going to just wait and see, yeah, see what the market loud. bears. Excited to see that S1, can't wait to dig in. <laughs> um, and what can you tell us about Lacework? Of course, a lot of, a lot of chatter in the marketplace. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of rumors, right? Everything, I think in this market, there's so many companies up for sale, other companies that are trying to be bought. It's, nothing surprises me. Um, so, I'm not going it's to, a, it's a rumor, so you can't comment on rumors, comment but on I rumors. think you, you never know in this market. So, we can't talk Patriots, because we yes, haven't asked. There's just nothing to talk <laughs> yeah, about. But good. luckily, we're from Boston. Yes. So we got Bruins. And Celtics. They snuck through. I was gonna. I was gonna. That was a sneak through. Throw too. something through my TV if they didn't win that game. <laughs> and we got the Celtics. So, uh, what do you think? Uh, Bruins showed some weakness yeah, during that last series. Yeah, I mean, right now yeah. you got to go with the Celtics because they've got the hot hands and they're they've just been dominant. And this is their year. But don't count the Bruins out. I mean, yeah. they got past a, a tough Toronto team. If they can, I mean, this is the big one. This is the ones the Florida. Florida knocked him out last year. I know, we hate Florida. We hate Florida. <laughs> now, as a, as a, as a Canadian. But right, he's you, a Bostonian. You, you know can't a little say bit about a... hockey, but where are, your, where are your loyalties now? Who, who's your team? <laughs> so I lived in Ottawa for eight years, yeah. and I'm a long-suffering Ottawa Sens fan. However, yeah. I've been rooting for the Bruins. I've ah, cool. lived in Boston for 22 years. Ottawa's a great city. And it is a great they city. They deserve to win. That, that drive by Pasternak at the end, they that, deserve that goal. Did you see and that goal? Feed. feed. Yes. yes. Yeah. Right. I thought that set it up, but it was hustle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is scrappy. Yeah, That's Bruins so. hockey. All right, hey, it's, there's nothing better than playoff <laughs> hockey. Is there? Guys, thanks so much for coming back. Thanks, to the David. Peter, Great to see Danny, you. Danny, good luck with everything. Thank you. Can't wait to see you guys next time here. I right, Keep it right there. We'll be back right after this short break from RSA 2024. You're watching theCUBE.